Good afternoon and welcome to the virtual Perez Art Museum Miami. My name is Marie Vickles and I'm the Director of Education. Today we are presenting The Wave, The Pre-Existing Conditions, the second in a series of three conversations that are presented in partnership with Indigo Arts Alliance and the Perez Art Museum Miami. The Wave brings together artists, scholars, and other specialists in varied fields of study to create dialogue around the current and future impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Black and Brown communities, both locally and globally. This series aims to prioritize the need for generative conversations that together with concrete actions are in service of and benefit our communities. Today's panel discussion will focus on the current headlines that tout pre-existing conditions as the reasons for disproportionately high coronavirus cases and mortality rates among Black and other communities of color. Here at the Perez Art Museum Miami, we are happy to support this special project that was generously shared with us by artist Nugent Smith, who currently has work on view in the exhibition, The Other Side of Now. Before I introduce Nugent and we begin today's program, I would like to acknowledge and thank the incredible team of people that work so very hard to make these programs come together online. Big thank yous to the entire PAM marketing team, Anita Bram, Associate Director of Adult Programs and Audience Engagement, and our world-class AV team, Denise Faxis and Andrew Berg. We could not do this without you all, thank you. Let's get started. Nujan Smith is a first-generation Caribbean-American interdisciplinary artist based in Jersey City, New Jersey. Through performance, found object, sculpture, mixed media, drawing, painting, video, photo, and writing, Nujan deepens his knowledge of historical and present-day conditions of Black African descendants in the diaspora. Trauma, spiritual practices, language, violence, memory, architecture, landscape and climate change are primary concerns in his practice. He holds an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and is the recipient of the Lenore Annenberg Performing and Visual Arts Fund, Franklin Furness Fund, and Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant. As you watch along today on Facebook or YouTube Live, please post some questions for our panelists. We will try to answer as many as possible in the Q&A portion of today's presentation. So with all of that said, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Nugent. Thank you very much, Anita. Um, thank you everyone for joining us here all around the world. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging, uh, taking a moment to honor the ceremony for our brother George Floyd this morning. First person I'd like to introduce is our moderator for today, uh, Maria Elena Ortiz. She's the curator at the Perez Art Museum Miami, where she has curated several exhibitions and programs and is developing PAM's Caribbean Cultural Institute. Her research, writing, and curatorial practices are informed by the connections of Latinx, Latin American, and Black communities in the U.S. and the Caribbean. Sierra L. Bryant was born and raised in Miami, Florida, and is a multidisciplinary creative residing in Dallas, Texas. Bryant uses photography and mixed media techniques to discuss the identity of Black culture and how it exists in the new millennium. Dr. Aisha Stroop has been an emergency medical medicine physician at Greenwich Hospital in Greenwich, Connecticut since 2017. Prior to that, she was an ER physician at Nyack Hospital for 10 years and JFK Medical Center for two years. Dr. Shoup completed her medical degree at the Penn State College of Medicine, where she was awarded the Lehigh Valley Hospital Community Service Award given to medical students who displayed exemplary service in the community and the Dean's Award. She has participated as a panelist and speaker for various health conferences and provided medical services to international health missions in Jamaica. She understands the importance of research, treatment, and community engagement for underprivileged, as well as promoting healthy life choices and enjoys volunteering. Tremaine Lee is a Pulitzer Prize and Emmy-winning 
journalist and correspondent for MSNBC and host of the Into America podcast. He examines politics, policy, and the power that both have in the lives of the American people, as well as the role of race, violence, and law enforcement in this country. He was part of the team that earned the Pulitzer Prize for coverage of Hurricane Katrina in 2006. In 2012, as a reporter for the Huffington Post, Lee was credited as the first reporter to bring the shooting of Trayvon Martin to a national audience. He has covered some of the biggest news stories of the last decade, including high profile cases of police violence and the killing of unarmed black men and women by police. And last but not least, we would like to introduce Niamun Nuane Machar, also known as Moon. She has worked at work as an advocate for disproportionate minority youth in the mental health field. In 2019, she was a recipient of the Rising Advocate Award from the Bellazon Center in Washington, DC. Moon is the regional coordinator for Youth Move Maine, a youth advocacy organization that helps at-risk youth find their voices and advocate for themselves. Moon's parents' use of parables, myth, folklore, and life memories have formulated much of her writing style and has given her a sense of responsibility to carry on in the tradition of storytelling. I would like to thank all of you for joining us today as part of this um, second edition of The Wave. Um, the Wave was conceived um, as part of my residency, which was supposed to be an in-person residency in Portland, Maine with Indigo Arts Alliance. And as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a conversation of how to think about shifting um, the purpose um, for, of the residency to make it more meaningful and relevant and more authentic um, for my personal artistic practice. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the staff and the founders of Indigo Arts Alliance for, first of all, granting me this fellowship and also in supporting me in this um, new reconfiguration of what is to be the residency. So I give thanks for all of you and your leadership and thanks for all of you for joining us today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Moon, who will begin and open up with a poem. Thank you. So this first piece is called, I Come From Away. Um, I was inspired to write this piece when I started to engage um, the group of asylum seekers that came to Portland, Maine in the summer of 2019 uh, with 400 coming here from the Southern borders. And it made me think about my first time in America and how I was experiencing and the fear that I had about the community I was coming into. I come from a place they call away. I'm not sure if it's safe to say why I came, but only that I'm looking for a place to stay. You see, I've walked through many lands desperately searching for a place I could call home, chased by a constant fear that my new home might only be a place called alone. I reach for sense tastes, something to remind me that there is a place where it was okay to be me, and in that place, I was once free. As I journeyed through miles, I came upon a stranger's land. Its coasts and beaconing lighthouses much different than my hot desert sands. I feared of the natives and how they would see, and how they would perceive my dark tone and structured bone. Would they accept a pilgrim that has ventured so far from her home? What would they think of the physical and emotional scars that I held? Would it make them shun my presence and question why I could not stay in the places where my great grandfathers dwelled? Would they apprehend me at their borders and lock me away? Would I only succumb to devastation now that I've entered that horror and fray? Or, or would they be a kind people, ready to embrace my broken, shattered spirit and soul? Would they usher me to places to once again feel whole? Is there the possibility that they would reach for me and give of their abundance and allow me to rest under the shade of their evergreen trees? Would they teach me their crafts so that I may embark on a mission, so that I may dare to dream the American dream and bring my fantasies of a new world to fruition? Maybe they would love the food, the spices, and the language that I bring, 
Maybe they would dance in Jubilee to the songs that my ancestors sang. Who is to know when you enter a new world? I suppose I shall keep those as a prayer of a young foreign girl. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Um, I wanna start by um, asking a question to everyone here on this panel. And I wanna say um, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, Victor Valencia, Sandra Bland, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Magdiel Sanchez, Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, Anthony Jose Vega Cruz, Abud Arbery, Tevon Martin, and countless others over many decades. Why do you think the murder of George Floyd ignited an international movement of protest? Well, um, I'll start by <laughs> saying that I think that um, as we go back to the topic, the name of this series, The Wave, and we came up with this idea, the, the, the name, The Wave, the title of The Wave, because we were thinking about all of the other things that are going to continue to um, compound upon the complexities um, of, that have come as a result of COVID-19. And so I think that we are seeing such a, a response um, as a result of this perfect storm that, has, um, that is our now. Right. So in thinking about how everyone has been going through all of that we've been going through with COVID-19 and being stuck in the house, also to feeling vulnerable, feeling all of the, the years of all of the things that we have already been complaining about and trying to, to, to get rectified within this United States society. Um, and the killing of George Floyd has essentially been that it, it, it acts like that, that 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 final spark if you will um where people have just just had enough so i think it's a, it's a mixture of all of all of this um going back to that that topic of the wave it's, this is another yet another wave that is is reaching us as um as as americans um as well as highlighting um the plight of black and brown people all around the world today um, and as a result of the pandemic, I feel like this is, this is why it's um, the way that it is at the moment. You know, I wanna, I wanna add that I don't think it can be lost on us uh, that there is this kind of accretion of violence, this accumulation. When you think about the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, uh, jogging in Georgia and two white vigilantes uh, track and, and shoot him down, gun him down, and it's captured on video. And then you have the, the killing of uh, Breonna Taylor, a no-knock warrant where police storm her, her, her house and shoot her in her bed. Mm -hmm. And then when her boyfriend responds, the system charges him with attempted murder. Mm -hmm. um, so you have white vigilante violence. You have th these wild no-knock warrants killing a woman as she sleeps in her bed. But then to watch George Floyd, another victim of state violence, lose his life um, the way he did. And we hear him crying out for his mother, his dead mother, and he, I can't breathe, as he's getting closer to death. And to watch the callous nature in which Officer Chauvin um, not only kneeled in him for eight minutes and 46 seconds, but when spectators are calling out to stop that he can't breathe, he puts his hands in his pockets. Again, the nature of black death, the spectacle of black death has not changed. So there's this continuum of, of state violence, vigilante violence, um, and the ease at which black life is so easily taken. And I think for a moment to, for us to watch that man lose his life and the literal life seep out of his body with that officer on his neck, I think no pun intended, the sheet from this system was ripped away. And I think people who are normally inclined to believe the old trope of he must have done something, right? He must have committed some crime. If only he would have complied, right? But we see this man handcuffed and prone. Um, and so I think there is no mistaking that you know that old saying, believe me or you're lying eyes. I think the system has been gaslighting us this entire time for hundreds of years. Like we are insane, like we are crazy. Like our, our cries for help and our pleas and even our, our rallying cries of, of even vengeance sometimes are, are fall on deaf ears. And so I think this time is different because we had that accumulation. And as Nugent said, um, the way COVID-19 has kind of bound us up and been an, an, another assault on the black community. 
And so I think all these things together with the video, because even in the uh, Ahmaud Arbery case, it's not that they didn't have the video, it's that we didn't see the video. So the video existed already. They were just concerned that the people would see it. And so I think um, it was kind of the perfect storm, uh, but it's all been like piece by piece, layer by layer, getting us to this point. I also want to add in addition in terms of the, the metal, medical aspect of coronavirus and, you know, we're isolated, as Nugent said, and, and we're all experienced and that's obviously going to have an effect on our psyche. Uh, in addition, I think it unveiled the, um, the vulnerability of the United States, how we're not the best at healthcare, the vulnerability of our healthcare system, and also how uh, black and brown communities are going to be at risk based on um, systemic practices of racism that we already know about. And so I work in a community that's pretty much affluent and very white. And all of my patients, for the most part, were uh, Hispanic because we, we neighbor Porchester. So a lot of our patients were Hispanic men. Um, obesity was a risk factor. And so you can't really argue that we have some sort of genetic discrepancy that's uh, increasing our risk for coronavirus. It's it's our housing practices. So when I when you come in and I say you have to go home and isolate yourself, how are you going to isolate yourself when you're living with you know five or six other people? Um, you're the essential worker. How are you going to stay home from work? You can't you know work, uh, be a grocery worker using your com computer. How are you going to not take public transportation? So all of those things um, are going to impact how we were susceptible to coronavirus. And I think seeing how our communities were so vulnerable and how we are the ones that um, were dying more and, and getting the virus more in addition to um, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and um, George Floyd sort of is like, um, it was like the icing on the cake. I mean, I look at the video, I never look at these videos, but I saw a George Floyd video and it was the same trauma of seeing, you know, all the videos before. But I think for my, um, my white colleagues, for whatever reason, I think all of this, seeing patients of, 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 of um, communities of color as opposed to our regular patients and, and seeing how our system is, is not um, perfect, I think all of that combined is like, yeah, maybe there's something wrong with the United States of America, in addition to, to living during Trump era. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I could just piggyback on that um, with that in, in relevance to the to the Trump era, I think the supported rhetoric at one of the highest seats that's supposed to um, represent that morality or at least act as that front um, or, or a buffer to try to ease or alleviate the tensions of a community doesn't exist. Um, not only that, it supports um, the, the the generalization of the suffering of the black body. Um, I have been supporting young people as they are protesting and in conversation, I see the rage that they have, but in my research and speaking with my mentors in the African American communities, when they began to tell me about the protests that happened in the sixties um, and, and the, the, where even the word picnic came from, um, how, how, how normal it was to watch the black body slowly suffer and lose life and how that was a tactic before. I think today, um, because of this quarantine fever um, and, and, and almost like the, the floodgates just opened. Um, not only do they open, I think now the, the black voice is able to be articulated in such a diverse amount of ways. Um, whether it be through the platforms of organizations that have already been doing this work or just pockets of black communities that are now starting to rise up and understand that we have like not only do um, we have to push into the protests and, and, the, and the streets, um, there are policy tables that, that and there are gatekeepers. Now, I live in one of the whitest states. And so now when I look up at, at and when I'm in Augusta in the state house and I look at all the walls and I see the, the pictures of the white judges that are start looking down at me and I constantly have to sit in, in, in this wonderment, what do they think of my black body in this space? More black people I feel like are starting to ask themselves that question. And before this 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 gaslighting of showing us this black suffering um, acted as a deterrent to our spirit. It acted as a way to suppress and, and show the power that a system has. But I think now that we start to look up and have seen 
Black um, individuals and places of power, it changes what the ask is and how that ask is displayed in the streets. Why we can just even people who are articulate, even um, uh, um, intellectuals, could justify looting because we could tie it so closely to an emotion that is so alien to um, this community here. I want to um, bring up the fact that since we all are at home and um, a lot of kids are also seeing some of these videos of trauma, it's one of those things that they're, they're starting to have the conversation with their parents a little bit more about it. So that raises a lot more concern. They're always um, attached to their, to their devices in general. But when you start to see the spreading of, you know, the traumatic video over and over and over again, you start to raise questions. And I think um, that brought a lot of attention to uh, parents asking questions, a lot of them um, being like, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? What does it mean for my body? What does this mean for your body? Um, and it brought a lot of insight to mass sharing of an image that we haven't seen in a really, really long time um, that quickly. Uh, and I really think that was one of the, things that set off this world view of like, this is a problem and we really need to address it as a community, um, as well as other people outside is coming in with, you know, um, support for us. And I, I really think as a teacher and as a facilitator, the kids are starting to put us in a more of a, a way of thinking that like, okay, the kids know, they can see it, we need to talk about it, we need to change something, they want to change something, they're more concerned, kids are out there fighting with us, it, they're showing up, so we have to show up for them, and that's bringing this whole wave, like Nugent said, this whole wave of new activists that are starting to take notice of like, these are things that are not normal. I want to add um, not only the healthcare uh, layer, but also the economic layer. I think that it also, the pandemic has also made obvious that, wow, what happens when you miss one paycheck? <laughs> and I still have to, uh, you know, there's no resources. There's nobody that is trying to, to, to help out on that respect. Um, I wanted to, to go into, since we're talking about protests, you know, the pandemic has also affected the way we protest. And I was wondering, I know that some of you are actually in the front lines, you know, and we all thank you because you're kind of the first responders. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering about like the healthy, the way to protest now during the pandemic and also about what you see in the front lines that is different from other times. Well, I don't know if um, I can necessarily comment there's like a healthy way to uh, protest because uh, inevitably you're going to be in crowds and we're saying, you know, obviously you shouldn't be in crowds. You should be six feet away from people, but, um, uh, and wear masks. So the, um, the visualization of people having protests with masks is refreshing, but, you know, inevitably we think that this is going to obviously cause a spike in coronavirus because people are just in large crowds. But, um, you know, I mean, people are very passionate about it. So I, I think it's a beautiful thing that people are protesting, but obviously we're still afraid that we're going to um, have a, a spike in coronavirus um, like we did uh, in the beginnings in March. Um, what was the other question that you had? I'm sorry. Uh, for the, for the, I know that uh, Tremaine and Moon, you guys are, you know, actively engaging in the front lines, you know, and Moon, you're, you're helping activists that are getting arrested and Tremaine, you're reporting. So what are you guys seeing that's different um, from other moments? I, mean, I think the, the one thing that stands out is that um, everyone understands that the inherent danger of gathering in large groups. But in this moment, people have decided to uh, risk all of that in the name mm -hmm. of, of tearing away or at least chipping at this white supremacist system that has, um, you know, subjugated and oppressed folks for, for so long. And so I think in the very beginning, uh, there was an attempt of like, how, how do we organize? After Maude Arbery had a conversation with the Reverend Al Sharpton, who has been obviously organizing and mobilizing for decades now. And there was actual real concern about, well, how do we do this? And so there were a lot of people holding a virtual protest and there were town halls and conversations uh, but once we got to the George Floyd case, we saw the floodgates open, beginning with the community in Minneapolis, 
And I think obviously we make a lot about um, the cross-racial, cross-cultural nature of this particular protest, which certainly helps move the system in a way uh, that previous uh, movements haven't. Uh, but it began in the communities. It began in Minneapolis and spread to other um, communities that, that bear the brunt of this. And those communities that were already, um, you know, feeling the weight of all the socioeconomic concerns. When you think about those images early on before the protest, and we all kind of shook our head at these young people having these parties, right? There was Chicago, there was this building with 300 people, young people partying. But these are young people who face the threat of bullets every single day. They are young people who have seen their friends being, being uh, shot and killed, abused by the police. And so we're dealing first with a group of young people who say, you know what, there are, wor there are worse things. What more can you do? So we're gonna come out there and push and make some noise um, and, and you know, express ourselves. And that's very different, obviously, circumstantially than what we've seen in the past. Um, and I, I think I think from my experience, what, I, what I've seen um, is so much of, of what uh, that my colleagues have mentioned around um, the equity about why the numbers are so much higher in the black community. And then as I'm looking out at the protesters, um, I do see that a lot more of the white community is, is wearing masks um, and I'm being a little more precautious about it, where you see a lot of the black communities they kind of throw caution to wind. And it is that, it's, it, it speaks towards that black struggle. We continuously have to sacrifice and offer up, whether it be our young, whether it be our, our voices, um, whether it be our safety to get this message forward. And I feel like which community has more to lose if this doesn't make it somewhere, if this movement doesn't go somewhere, it feels like it's our community that has more to lose. It's our community that could get our narrative hijacked um, if we decide to, to retract. And so I feel like that's what keeps it going. But then as I see the practice and the cultural components of it, I do see that there is a community that is a little more cautious um, and is wearing the mask and keeping it on for you know the, the, the duration of the protests. Where I see some of our young people, they're getting really fired up because their emotions are so much more closely tied to it that they don't have it in, 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 their, in their capacity right now because of the emotional state that they're in to have these thought and that, and that consideration. And so at this point, even for myself, I, I spoke with Nugent um, yesterday where I said, you know, I had to ask myself, am I willing to risk coronavirus to be out here? And I had to, it was a resounding yes, because I know this message is so important. I have black brothers. I have a brother in the system. I watch the system and snare him. And so if I don't get out and get this narrative out, somebody else is going to tell it for me and it's not going to give it justice. Mm -hmm. And then I remember seeing this, um, an article that talks about, well, not an article, but people are sharing this images and, and text across social media. And it, it asks the question or it's, it makes the statement that um, we all have the different roles to play. You know, so um, I was yesterday in talking to Moon, we were talking about how, you know, if you are vulnerable, you have someone in your home that, that's vulnerable to, um, susceptible to um, coronavirus, uh, what do you do? Right? How can you, in your most authentic way, um, participate and support those who are um, out there on the street or doing the work that, that's um, part of this? So I think about when we talk about the front lines, especially right now, I think the front lines itself takes so many different forms um, and, and many different forms that we may not necessarily con consider a front line. Right? You have front line of, of the financial backing of, of organizations as well. You have the front line of people on the street, front line of people in the medical field, front line of people who are doing the mental health work. So I think about the front lines having many different, um, many different faces. Yeah, and on that uh, on that sense, you know, Sierra, you've been doing a lot of work with redlining in Dallas, which, in a way, you know, talking about pre-existing conditions. Um, I was wondering if you can speak a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I recently did a uh, project for my thesis, uh, my thesis show, and my thesis write, um, written statement that had to do a lot with the effects of um, redlining and segregation that happened in Dallas and how it pushed out certain communities to these very specific pockets and then the la lasting effects of them. So um, I started seeing the trends that are the lack of grocery stores, the lack of hospitals, the lack of um, medical care that was in these communities as well as what surrounds them, thinking about public transportation and how long it's taking to get you know, to um, a job or a community center. Um, and how it's slowing 
it's killing us faster because we can't get to the things that we need, um, such as medical attention, attention and food. But it's also putting us at a despair that we can't even bring wealth back into our communities to get to the point to basically um, put the money where it needs to be in taxes to um, fund schools, as well as um, community projects. Uh, I did six to seven weeks of studying um, the historic district that I live in in Dallas and Oak Cliff as well as East Dallas and um, the past history of Deep Ellum and how that was a black community and the pushing out and the effects of that and how the taxes change in very specific streets, like with, within two or three streets, you have a different school district um, funding one and then another. So um, it really showed me how much that we're lacking um, and just support for ourselves. Like we can't support ourselves. None of us in this community really own that much of the land over here. Um, it's outside people that are, we're paying to live here and it's not doing anything for us. And the funding's not here for us to even get local grocery stores. So it's, it's really upsetting and it's really frustrating, but I had to use it to make work about why are these things happening to us and what is it causing down the line? It causes trauma. It causes pre-existing conditions. And the fact that like the reason we're not healthy is because we don't have the food sources to be healthy. We don't have the medical care here to be healthy. We can't get to the medical care anywhere else. And this is causing us to have generations of illnesses that we have to combat in a different way because it, we don't have the access to it. Um, I was wondering, Aisha, about, um, I know that you work with this concept of holistic medicine. I was wondering if you could um, speak a little bit about that and how it could be useful in this moment. I think I more so do that on a personal front. Um, so obviously we know that, um, as we were talking about, your immune system is directly tied to your health, right? And so there are a lot of things that you can do to build your immune system such that you're not susceptible to diseases like coronavirus. It doesn't mean that it's an absolute, but um, it does mean that it will be helpful for you to stay healthy in general. And so, you know, as uh, Sierra was just talking about, um, our access to food and the foods that we're eating will contribute to um, our immune system and our health. Uh, things like vitamin C, vitamin D, um, quercetin, you know, things like that will um, help with our immune system. In fact, there have been studies that um, vitamin C has cured, um, has uh, lowered mortality in, in sepsis, which is uh, a bacterial infection in your bloodstream. Um, and um, also as an anti-cancer agent, um, you know, me using it in my practice, I don't do so because I'm in emergency department. By the time you get to me, you technically have an emergency. And, um, and so I'm treating, treating that. But on a personal level, I know for a fact that it actually is, is quite helpful. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, things that you do to help with your immune system will definitely help uh, with your health overall. Um, I wanted to ask you, Tremaine, I know, you know, in your podcast, Into America, you have interviewed you know, a lot of great leaders. And I was wondering if from your conversations, if something resonated uh, from who, what was that, that could also be inspiring for this moment? Um, I, I don't know if there's one individual who said anything that was particularly inspiring, um, but I did want to kind of piggyback off what Sierra and Aisha were talking about. Uh, one, the way black folks and people of color and marginalized communities are already kind of geographically clustered in certain spaces, densely populated spaces, and access to um, healthy food and healthy water. When we think about um, the pre-existing conditions that made people uh, more susceptible to COVID-19 and heightened the lethality of it, um, it's respiratory, right? So not only are our bodies segregated, but the very air that we breathe is also segregated. So I did a, an episode of Into America um, where we went down to New Orleans, um, and it's a place called uh, Cancer Alley. It's an 85-mile stretch between uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and New Orleans where there are over like 215 oil refineries. And so the people that are breathing this air are mostly clustered around the Mississippi River community, which are mostly black. These are places that once were plantations. And then over time, the, uh, they sold this land to corporations. 
but black folks can, can, can't drink the water. Those who still live off the land can only eat certain amount of the food that you hunt, right? People are dying young. People are getting cancers, um, all because of, again, the way that we've been segregated in these spaces. And so it's not just, we talk about pre-existing conditions, it, you're smoking, are you eating, that there are these lifestyle choices. Um, but as an environmental scientist described to me, COVID-19 was like a heat-seeking missile for these kinds of vulnerabilities. And I love the idea of this um, pre-existing condition, right? It reminds me of what um, an emergency room doctor in Chicago told me. He said, there's no such thing as post-traumatic stress disorder. It's present traumatic stress disorder, right? So this idea of this thing that was before, um, but from our experience in America, it's always been this way, right? There's this acceptable level of black pain and black grief connected to all these things. So whether you're in cancer alley, dying young and having strange sores and cancers, right? Or whether you're in in West Harlem and you're surrounded by seven bus depots, or you're in a place that has been um, pushed to the side, you know, access to, to, to food, right? Healthy foods. I think it's all connected. Um, so I don't know if I've had anything, uh, any inspiring conversations, but through the podcast, being able to engage with the system, engage with these issues from a, a very kind of um, nuanced lens, I think has been inspiring because right now is the time to push. Right now is the time to educate those who don't understand the systemic nature of the way that we live and die in America, right? And because we live and die in completely different ways, we tend to die slowly from these diseases and the comorbidities and everything that is associated um, to our experience as black people in America. Um, so that's not really answering your question, but I just wanted to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. I keep thinking um, about what's gonna like unfold, <laughs> um, you know, as we think about the next few months, you know, first of all, in thinking about um, the result of all these people gathering in mass all around the country. Um, what's that gonna do for um, the future of COVID-19 within our communities, especially. Um, but then I also think about as it, as it relates to the kind of quote unquote reopening of different states and um, the fall is right upon us. What about schools, right? So we got schools where, you know, our children are going to schools where, where they don't have doctors and nurses in the, in the school. How are these, um, what kind of precautions are they really going to be taking to protect the children um, that are going back into this? Um, so I, I, these are some of the things that are on my mind in, in, immediately at this point. You know? Hey, Nugent, th and, th and think about this idea of as soon as we started to realize and we started to publicize and the data started coming in about who was being disproportionately affected, that's when you saw these white folks coming out with their guns and protesting the stay at home orders, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're in a lot of these states, especially red states, but pick any state, they're all kind of, they all kind of operate the same. Once you're outside the city and the suburbs, it changes. The density, the, pop the, density, the population density changes, the actual race of folks start to change. So the risk we're running, this push to reopen in a state like a Texas or pick any of those states where those folks who live outside the city centers are going to be fine. Look at, look at Georgia. We're going, I, I'm, I'm almost willing to put a, a bet on what we see coming out of Georgia in the, in the following weeks or months. Or there are a number of states where um, the hospitalizations are actually going up. And then we start to see what happens in our communities. So I don't think you can kind of um, unhinge those two efforts, right? The, the realization that it's hitting black and brown and vulnerable communities um, with the idea of who's protesting the open and who's pushing the open sooner than possibly we need to. In addition to, I mean, everything that you guys said is completely accurate, but, you know, when we talk about um, the holistic side of, of health and our recommendations as physicians, we know stress is directly tied to um, your health, your immune system. And so being a, a black and brown in America, like you're constantly stressed, the PTSD is real. And so for you to come in and say, um, you know, in terms of dealing with your high blood pressure and your diabetes and your healthy eating choices, it's very easy for me or anyone um, in a place where we have access to food and access to being able to meditate and to take a break and take away, uh, you know, just not deal with the stresses of life. It's very easy for some people to do that as opposed to others. You can't just not deal with everyday life, which is, or a lot of people in everyday stressor, which obviously is going to contribute to these pre-existing conditions that our communities are so too, you know, susceptible to. You know, um, I was wondering about the media, and this is also for everyone. Um, how do you guys think the media is covering um, what's happening? Are, what are they focusing? What are they not focusing in? You know, what are they? What are the holes that they're not presenting? Uh, one of the things that I want to bring up, because Tremaine brought up Texas and Dallas specifically, um, 
the thing that they're not talking about a lot is where the testing centers were um, and how long it took for some of the testing centers to pop up. Um, specifically in Dallas, we bought this thing about suburbs and being spread out. Um, but in South Dallas, where I am, there was only one testing center um, for COVID and it took a month to even get up and running, whether there were six up in, you know, you know, West Dallas and then like getting closer to the suburbs of Plano and Richardson, there were like multiple and you can just drive through and they were readily available. And that's one of the things that it took uh, Dallas Morning News about a week and a half to uh, talk about where the testing centers were and then how often that they were uh, bringing up the numbers. But they also neglected to discuss like why these things were happening and it just disappeared. After they figured out black and brown people were dying, it kind of disappeared. Dallas Morning News only writes about it once now a day instead of three to four or five times they went when they start when COVID started coming through the suburbs. You know, now, now I'll speak. I'll speak on the media. You know, I've been part of um, media organizations my entire adult career. Um, but I think part of the problem is there is no disconnection between society writ large and the the the, the systems at play than the media. Also, you know, I've always pushed for more diversity in the newsroom because, quite frankly. Um, you know, I'm at MSNBC and NBC, and we actually do a better job than most. But when you look around, there still aren't many of us in there, right? So when people are having meetings and they're wrestling with these ideas, um, it's often in a silo or a vacuum. And we, as we know, whether you're college educated and an editor at, you know, whatever paper or a news director, um, you've often gotten that same education that the rest of us have, which is filled with um, false narrative, right? So the way that people arrive at these stories is already like looking through a, a glass of Vaseline smeared on it anyway, right? It's distorted anyway. And, and so I think with, there are um, journalists who, who um, do have the, the depth and ability to handle these stories, and there's a lot of great journalism coming out of it. But the media, by and large, especially when it comes to um, what we see with the uprisings and rebellions now, it's so easy for us to turn when the flames are there. But when, are, are we always there when, when the, nothing's burning, right? Are we there in the community engaging with um, what matters most, right? When people are crying out every single day, or did it take fl flames and bloodshed and violence for us to turn the camera? We know the answer to that, right? It's the latter. That's what gets people moving, unfortunately. Um, so I think we've, but it's almost like asking um, America or capitalism to solve things that are ant ant antithetical to what they actually are. So sometimes the very nature of what we do, we can't ask the media to do much more than, than it's built to do, right? And I think that's slowly changing as people are recognizing what's what, and we have the language now, we can, I can say on national TV, you know, white supremacist ideals. Mm -hmm. We could talk about white, we could, we could have, actually have this conversation because the ground has been seeding, seeded enough with the language of it. Um, so I think, I think the machine is changing, but again, it's just like any other American institution for better and worse. I always, like in relation to that is sometimes I get so frustrated when I listen because it feels like when I hear, you know, the, the, the host of a show um, with the, the guests on and they ask, like some of the questions that they ask, I'm like mm -hmm. saying to myself, how the hell is this question even helpful or relevant or mm -hmm. meaningful at this point? So it's like, that's what you're going to waste your time asking, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, as well as this kind of thing of the, you know, talking points and all of this kind of stuff. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I wonder where can one go to get like accurate, like not accurate, but news that's going to be beneficial um, for the community. And I was watching something, um, the other day, I forget what program it was, but they talked about the importance of local news and how local news is more likely to give you the information that you specifically need for your community. The things, the questions like, so for instance, as, uh, Sarah brought up, like, where are the testing centers in my neighborhood, the local news, but then as a result of corporate media and, and economics and capitalism, the local news starts to disappear. Right. So we have like all of these big conglomerates, um, which does not provide us with the information that we really need. You know, you know, so I think like, what, is one of the what do we do? <laughs> one of the things I want to talk about really quick, speaking of like local news is um, uh, for a while, I was like trying to get stuff off of Dallas Morning News on the website. And like you have to sign up with your email and do all these things to read uh, an article or a document or something. And you had to do all these things that are kind of dis uh, disproportionate to the people that it needs access to it. Like the fact that I have to have an email address to sign up to get news information, it's like, it's extremely hard. 
And that's something like that's on the website. Like I can't even get to it without signing up. And it's something that's locally in my neighborhood and I need to know about. And it's really kind of frustrating that. And then like um, radio is the only free media I would consider of something that we can get access to quickly. But the people that are talking about stuff on the radio, is it, they're really not going into it as much as, you know, Mm. we should, Uh, you know, internet is available, but it's not available for everybody. But we all learned that with COVID and how kids are not getting access to learning materials because they didn't have Wi-Fi. TV is also one of the things that are not, you know, in everybody's homes as much as we would like to say, like everybody has a TV. Not everybody has access to basic news channels. And it's like, why are these things so hard to access if it's supposed to be here for our community? But it's not, I think that's, 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 that's the thing. It's not really supposed to be there for the community. I learned a long time ago that the, the, the yeah. news, right, when I was writing for newspapers, it's to get your eyes to the advertising. Right. So mm-hmm. we're just we're, right. we're finding a way to pull you here. And sometimes it's actually useful information. It's important. I believe in journalism to my very core. Right. And so it's very important and critical to a democracy. But again, the whole point is to get you to watch the TV so that these ads are very, very expensive. Right. Um, Nugent, to your, to your point about the local news and the national. And I've been in both. Right. The problem with the local news is they are so in bed with the police chief, the mayor, the, because you're dealing with them every single day that it, it's also often hard to get the truth because it's always filtered through that, those relationships. And you don't want to ruin your relationships by being by scrutinizing too much because you still have to talk to them tomorrow. The nationals, you have a better opportunity because we can step back, but then it's so big that do we lose sight of the actual people, right? The mm-hmm. actual on the ground issue. Um, so it's, it's some of it's logistic, but also it's like there, there are, and again, I'm biased as a journalist. So there are a bunch of journalists creating journalism that is very, really useful, very important. Um, but it's, again, it's always through the lens of we are in these big corporate entities, right, with, with sometimes a corporate interest. And you, as a journalist, you can lose yourself in that if you're not very careful, if you're not kind of mission-driven and focused. So, so I, I guess, want to, I know, Moon, you want to say I, something? Yeah, just yeah. real quick. Yeah. If I could just speak to, specifically to immigrant communities and how they consume information and how they're watching um, so much of, of the, the news and how the media is representing a story. I The disconnect for me is... Um, who who the, the news is for. And I appreciate that you said that it's really to bring you in for the ads because I watch and within my education, I, I see, I find I'm triggering things in the news, but I look around and I look at my parents and they're completely unscathed and, and, and unmoved by it. Um, and when I think about um, one of my favorite quotes is until the lion learns to speak, the tale will glorify the hunter. And when I watch the news reportings of how it comes out and you talk about them being in bed with certain police officers, I see that there's such a crafty way that uh, a story could be told that starts to, to break, bring down or, or even um, um, lessen the, the, the seriousness of murder, like mm-hmm. to call it a tragedy, you know, to, to not name the things that it is. It's almost like an appeasement of white guilt. It's we're going to name that it's something unfortunate that happened, but we're not going to dive really deep into what it was, a man was murdered. And so, you know, we have our police chief saying, you know, this was a terrible tragedy that we, no, the tragedy is a mother having to bury her child. Um, The horror was the murder and that's what we needed to be named. And that's what we need these figures who are wearing the blue um, uniforms, who are standing in the places of power to name what their, their counterparts did and what the people within their own constituents did. One, one so, small thing, and this is just as we're news consumers, and I've, I've obviously confronted this a lot, but the idea that the language matters, right? So, so murder is a legal term, right? So oftentimes we don't say murder because it needs to be, you need to go through court and it needs to be um, d- determined that it's actually a murder conviction before it's murder. So sometimes there is a dancing around the language because there are legal matters here. He was killed. It was a homicide, meaning it was intentional. Um, but, but to your point, I think it's, it, it's it's right, right? But, but again, it, it depends on, that's why I push for newsroom diversity. So you have people with different ideas in these spaces to, to tell the story and center the people and center the experiences. And that's what you're talking about. It's off center all, all, oftentimes because those who are projecting the news have no direct connection to those who are most impacted by it. So I mean, I, you're, you're right. So we got one of our first questions from the internet. This is from Brittany Ingram. And she asks, do you all think there is a way to engage non-academic communities in these conversations without going in with a savior complex? I, I think, I think um, just to clarify what, what non-academic communities um, exactly, what, what, what is meant by that. Um, I think that 
there is there is an articulation um, in a community that's not always represented through the academic lens. Um, and there is a potential to engage and grow and provide um, platform for a community that is not through the academic lens. When I think about, um, you know, even I, I did a residency with Indigo Arts Alliance and the platform that it gave me to be able to speak back um, in a way that I know my community can understand was a way of, of stepping forward. And then to have other community members come in and see, because I mix my art and, and the policy work and the, and the conversation, to be able to bring two communities from that higher echelons of, of, of a white community that just wants to experience, um, you know, the ambiance of, of black art and then the, the black community that really needed their voice elevated and they needed to see their representation somewhere, finding places for these people to come together and have the conversation and understand that each group holds a knowledge that the other group needs and not and, and not in this you know other other uh, you know way that it's that it's arranged I think that in itself the ways that you frame a question speaks to that savior complex of you know putting down a, a certain community because of, of an academic uh, potential I think with um uh, well, with my experience, and I think as um, in the academic forefront of medicine, I think that there's a lot of information on the internet. Um, I think in coronavirus in general, we are learning about the virus as it was ravaging communities, right? And so when the virus first started, it was if you came from China, that's who had the virus when it was already in Iran. You couldn't even get testing because the CDC had very strict instructions and you would call them first and say, well, I have this patient that does this and the other. And they would say, no, I don't think that they have it. Send them home. All right. So they already probably had it, went home, and then we start to spread it. And so I think there was probably a huge distrust uh, amongst patients because, you know, there isn't much of a treatment. We don't have the answers. We're coming in. It's all over the news that you could die from this disease and we're saying, oh, no, you're okay. Go home. Sorry, I don't have anything for you. Um, and so when it comes to having conversations in general about this virus and about your health in general, I think that as a physician, you need to be able to um, explain things in a not so confrontational manner and uh, be able to gain trust from a patient, which is quite hard as an emergency medicine because it's not like I have relationships with a lot of patients before they come in, but in general, in the community, right, as primary care physicians, as your cardiologist, as your neurologist, there needs to be a better relationship. Uh, which oftentimes is restricted based on um, time with patients, based on billing, based on paperwork and, you know, other factors. So I think it is possible. Obviously, I think that um, there just needs to be uh, a way to discuss it without uh, offending people. Um, we have another question. Um, this one's from Lisa Murphy. She's asking, how do you all think we can move forward in addition to the work that is already done? Now that brings up a, a great point, and it was something I wanted to touch on um, closer to the end. But um, one part of uh, the conceiving of this program is thinking about what steps, concrete steps we can take to make a difference. And this is actually a challenge at this moment, um, to be honest, uh, for me personally, in, in thinking about what steps um, we can take specifically that's authentic and helpful um, to the community. And what I would like to ask is that if as you're thinking of things or you know of some sort of resource or you know of some sort of um, organization um, or some sort of uh, some answer to something that we have been posing here, please put it in the um, in 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 the in the chats that you're sending questions through, and or um, email it to me, please at nugensmith at gmail .com. That's n y u g e n smith at gmail .com. I would love to hear from people who have ideas of specific things that we can do to be a benefit to the community. Okay. Um, I do want, I have another question and two comments. Um, one was from, for Tremaine from Anna Withholt. She, she was commenting, this is why you independent voices, artists, organizations, writers are so important. Thank you to the hosts and the speakers for this really good conversation. And then I had another comment from Leslie McBain 
saying take over public access stations and produce the shows and news you want to see. Their public access stations across the country come see come see me at Portland Media Center in Portland, Maine. Um, and then I had another question, which is actually it's from Marie, that she's asking, the current system of economics directly stem from contribute and uphold all the connected issues that reinforce systemic racism, housing, access to food and healthcare, workers' rights, environment, et cetera. Can each of the panelists give one example or some guidance of how they are addressing the role of economics in their respective works on a daily basis? You know, I, I think for me, um, economic justice, social justice, um, these aren't fringe ideas. For me as a journalist, they're central to, to the stories I'm telling. So I'm always centering that experience, um, not only just one, to educate people who don't understand the interconnectedness of all this stuff, and that all stems back to our enslavement, you know, this country's original sin. So every opportunity I get to tell the story, recentering us and reminding folks of what this actually is. You know, again, we have this perception of America because the red, white, and blue, and the pride and the exceptionalism. But what it really is, it's built on the backs of a lot of um, struggle and pain and trauma and grief, and uh, quite frankly, the theft and rape of, of peoples and land and economic access. When you go back to um, the Reconstruction area, where there was that 12-year process where America was rebuilding, coming out of, of enslavement, and Black folks, land, businesses, and then you saw the pendulum uh, swing back during the redemption period where federal troops left the South and let the white South take over again. And they instituted new forms of economic enslavement, right? So slavery just kind of shifted a bit. So they were gonna get their money out of us somehow, some way, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was our free labor, our actual land, everything that we developed was then attacked and stolen, right? Let's have these real conversations so that we can be clear eyed about where we are right now. Because, you know, we go around, you know, shrugging our shoulders saying, well, why are these disparities? Why do these disparities exist? Why is the wealth gap? Well, we know why. We, we know why. You're either willfully ignorant or um, uneducated, right? So I think part of this is recentering the idea and everything, everything that we create, every, uh, everything that we do is pushing forward a more just America, which starts with acknowledging um, the failures and faults of the system and what the system actually is. Yeah, on that note, I do want to say that for me, I think a lot about, you know, all the Confederate monuments, those were put in after the civil rights movement, like the system of oppression, it's very, uh, adapts itself very well. So, you know, as, as we move forward, I hope that we are also thinking about all those episodes and how to really create real change, transformative change, because the system is always going to try to adapt and it adapts very, very well. And um, I think the, um, uh, one last thing about that um, in terms of Marie's question, uh, for me personally, at least in our household, we've been making a, a more intentional effort to find black owned businesses, uh, minority owned businesses um, and services to, um, to, to keep that dollar circulating among us. Um, all of the things that we do, um, there, are, there is someone who looks like us out there that's actually doing it as well. Um, it just takes, uh, it's, it's as a matter of time and research um, and sharing the information. So like reaching out to people that we know to say, hey, I'm looking for a black accountant. <laughs> and um, can, you, can you recommend someone to me? Um, I'm looking for, um, we're, we're actually needed of athletic gear. And I'm trying to find, is there a black owned company that produces this, right? And we, by asking, we found um, someone who produces these types of things. So keeping the dollar within the community. If I, if, I, if I could also speak to that, I think it's about also taking this, this conversation, this dialogue to communities that haven't heard it before. Um, mm -hmm. This the conversation of equity and racial equity. I know for a fact there are communities that where these are alien concepts. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we take that, that spirit of entrepreneurship and give people the resources to move that forward um, with legality, with documentation, and start to really build themselves um, as an entity and an enterprise. Um, I know here there's so many talented um, members in the in the in the uh, 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 the community of color, um, but that fear of having a storefront, that anxiety of putting your name on a business, it's almost, it was like this strategic 
um, conditioning that happened that I see with many in the immigrant communities, but as I'm, 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 I'm mentored by many in the African American communities, I understand that it was a systemic oppression that happened. That how dare you move forward with wanting to become your own? Why not mm. just sell it for this person, or why not just give this idea or work under this person, or become a cook or a chef in this person's restaurant, rather than than moving forward and taking that 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 venture on yourself? So I think that here within as we're talking about it and seeing um, the, the professionalism that's represented, it seems like the, the conversations stay at the top bubble of many of the, of the Black communities. And so how do we take that conversation and introduce it to communities where it is alien to them and, and, and motivate them to feel okay, even if they don't have all the information, to bring it to tables, to gather that information without shame? I think that when we go back to that academic question, that's where it starts to stunt a community because of that fear and that anxiety around that that you know that expectation of already having the knowledge when you just don't have it, you know. I have another question here by Xavier Carter. Um, they're asking, what are some of the ways that you think we can mitigate the internal conflict between members of the Black communities involved in moving forward revolutionary action? I think if I could just speak to this, just because I see that here, here in um, Portland, Maine, being one of the whitest states, um, I would say 80% of the protesters um, are under the age of 26-ish, and it, it's a very young. So I think um, Black mentorship um, the, the, is so important. Not only that, the, the, the understanding and the history behind the oppression and, the, and learning from, from the tactics um, and the practices of protesters who have taken even the smallest step of a, of a movement forward. When I think um, I spoke to um, one of my mentors, Reverend Lewis, and he was telling me about the protests that happened down south when they would capture, when the media would capture pictures of um, black uh, black protesters being hosed, and who that was a strategic thing that that this community did in order to to um, to show that the the black community up north hey this is what th this 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 southern community is going through but with that there are also the i think when you talk beautifully to um the role of everyone and what a front line looks like because the organization that is needed to be able to combat a narrative is through press releases and having you know a, a piece of your own voice um, interjected and that could combat or or confirm um or conflict with with what the, the, the master medias are saying. And so the organizational piece, I feel in so many places that I've seen it here is lacking. The emotion is there. You can validate everything that they're feeling. Um, there are members of the black community, but they're also divided members of the black community. I'm from the African diaspora. I understand the hand of the oppressor through crisis, refugee um, 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 issues, and, and that's where it, it comes to my plight. And so for me to learn this new oppressor who is right in my face, not masked through NGOs, I'm going to have to connect with a black community that has already here, has already been tried, generational traumas, and really seen the, the sinisterness of how the, the tentacles reach into a community. Um, when I came, I came at five years old, I didn't have that, that history or that understanding of what this conditioning um, was. So I think that that partnership and needing members of uh, specifically the African-American community, to really come in and take on really strong mentorship and leadership um, roles in, in helping young people articulate um, that, that emotion that they're feeling. Because I feel like there's a calloused um, understanding within a, a certain generation where they could put emotion aside and articulate it very solemnly um, to the understanding of the younger, enraged um, protester and individual. Okay, well, I have one last question, um, and this one is from Ness Alex. At this moment, can we as a community test and treat ourselves? Do we have any resource on grassroots level to deal with corona moving forward? Did, did you hear that? Can you repeat the question again, please? Yes, of course. Um, at this moment, can we as community test and treat ourselves? Do we have any resources on grassroots level to deal with corona moving forward? 
Mm. Yeah, I wonder if it's testing for the coronavirus or treat ourselves. At this mm. point, can we, as a community, test and treat ourselves? Do we have any resources oh, no, on grassroots level? I think that, um, as Sierra said before, like these testing sites are a lot of, are not widespread um, and, and definitely not in all communities. And so in terms of testing, I think that's still limited. Um, and then in terms of treatment yourself, um, if you can um, do things to build your immune system, whether it's taking vitamins, whether it's de-stressing, whether it's um, having access to and eating healthy foods, I think that's how you can treat yourself. But obviously, don't sit at home. If this is something that becomes severe, you definitely would need to seek um, professional treatment. Well, I want to thank all of the panelists and thank you for being here um, this this lunch hour with, with us. And I also want to invite you for the next and final conversation of the way, which is Wednesday, June 17th. Um, so it would be great to, to have you again. Thank you. And um, Nujan, lastly, do you want to uh, send out your email or any resources yes. so people communicate directly with you? Yep, absolutely. So um, we can continue this conversation and um, I would like any suggestions on uh, specific steps that we can take um, going forward as this con situation continues to evolve with us. Um, you can reach me at NugentSmith at gmail.com, N-Y-U-G-E-N Smith at gmail.com. Hey, thank you all so much thank for you. joining us. Really appreciate it. And um, have a wonderful yeah. day. Lesson. Thank Peace. you. Thank you.